go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We are now in Lent. Seems like we were, feels like last week we were in Christmas. The week before, it feels like we were. <laughs> yeah. We're so glad that we are now at the beginning of this uh, new time in the church cycle, which is creates our regular rhythms of we have Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter. And uh, for our uh, Lenten season this time around, we will be focusing on the table. But it's really the central um, act that the church does together every Sunday, which is you will see during the course of the next five Sundays that we will be examining what does that mean, right? What does the church do at the table? Uh, what do we receive at the table? What have Christians in the past have said in the table? Um, and what is the result from us the eating from the table? And so today is the day in which we will be discussing kind of what do we believe about the central act of worship, which is eating and drinking the body and blood of Jesus. And today we will be specifically talking about uh, how this appears through two central aspects of our worship, our hymns and our liturgy, our hymns and our liturgy. We will be, I will be briefly starting our time with discussing what is our theology, and then we're going to show you how the theology comes alive through our hymns, our various hymnals that you see here. Some of these are not hymnals, but hymnals are worship resources, our Eucharistic rite, and we will probably end with a discussion on future, what we call, where is the Eucharistic liturgy going now? And I will hand this uh, nice little worksheet out for you. And we'll be talking a little bit about this wonderful piece here that was uh, donated by uh, the now deceased uh, Reverend uh, Boyd Faust, uh, who was, uh, I think uh, many can speak a little bit more to, to who he was, but I will, I will say that he was a good colleague of uh, Reverend Dirk. He was the historian for what became to be known as the, the Seminary in Exile Movement of the 1970s. And was a lively missionary to one of our community, one of our partners, our global partners, the, the Central African Republic, the Lutheran Church in the Central African Republic. So I want to really begin. It's this wonderful resource. It's it's, it's not. It's from a, it's the Oxford History of Christian Worship. Um, if you have the free time and you're so interested in worship, by all means, it's an extremely exhausting. <laughs> there is a wonderful article here um, by Hans Christoph Schmidt Lauber. He talks about our Lutheran tradition. So he talks about the Lutheran tradition in the German lands. And he makes this interesting quote. And it's 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 not necessarily the full quote that I'll do. I'll I'll, I'll bracket it, but I, I want us to begin with this. The renewal of worship did not begin with new forms. Luther's conduct in the matter was decidedly conservative. His starting point was deeper in that he required a new understanding of worship from the Articulus Santus et Cadentis Ecclesiae, the, the article by which the church stands and falls, which is the evangelical message of the justification of the sinner by the grace of God through faith without any merit on the sinner's part. And then further on, Luther's understanding of worship, and i.e. the Eucharist, follows a pattern of address and response. The work of God which is the gifts that we receive through body and blood, elicits the answering work of faith. The divine service is God's work toward humans by which faith is awakened, sustained, and deepened. It is God's gift. So that's really at the heart of, well, I would say, we can go through, we will uh, we'll eventually go through what the Book of Concord says in its various various confessional documents, but that's really at the heart of Luther's understanding of any sacrament. God's gift that is a gift that has, does not require anything on my part. It is a gift that's freely given to me, to you, to all of us. That's fair? Nope, go ahead. Oh, there's nothing to add to that. Nothing to add to that. There's nothing, there shouldn't be anything to add to that, right? right. <laughs> I would, like to, I would like to add my basic understanding of Lutheran theology is God will forgive every sin except one. That's if you don't sing all the verses of the hymn. <laughs> it's a sin if you sing the first 15 verses at the first of the service, the last 15 verses at the end of the service, but 
God will forgive that. Amen. It's pretty well what action. God forgives everything. By the way, including if you don't sing all the verses. Uh, Mandy, you're going to need to move. Um, move. Or, yeah, well, remember, you just move in a little bit because these folks can adjust to see you. I would get a little closer to the owl. Uh, closer to the owl. All yes, because right. remember, we're, yeah, and that's what's recording. Oh, closer to the owl. <laughs> Sammy the owl. Yeah. <laughs> that was, okay. <laughs> that was, Is that better? Barely. Come on, guys, just a little oh, bit, sure. just a little bit. I, because of the, the hearing yeah, and the recording. Okay. Yeah, thank y'all. <laughs> All right, so this is the Book of Conflict. <laughs> Who knows what this book is? What, what's this book is comprised of? Nobody. Nobody? I should know. So the Book of Concord, it has a, it got its final shape in 1580. <laughs> this was, this is comprised of a collection of Luther's catechisms, a set of confessional documents written by Melanchthon, as well as a, what we call as the Apology, so a public defense of the chief confessional document, which is the Oxford Confession, uh, of which there is an appendices uh, to, the, to the Oxford Confession, which is a treatise on the primacy of the Pope. Um, as well, there are a set of post-Luther slash post first generation Lutheran writings that are called the formula and uh, the formula of Concord, which is comprised of what we know as the epitome, which is a summaration of what the second generation Lutherans thought about several articles of, of contention and argument that, that occurred um, throughout all the Lutheran Reformation and as well um, as the solid declaration, which is an expansive explanation of each of these points that eventually Lutheran said, this is what we kind of agree on, kind of. <laughs> so it's worth saying that the Lutheran World Federation, which is 70 million Lutherans around the world, um, they accept this list, which is in our constitution, by the way, when you look at the constitution, it's the Augsburg Confession, which is the basic theological statement of the church. It's, and it's the only one theological statement, I'm gonna say this, which has, Little to argue because it's uh, with because it's so um, carefully written and kind of precise. It's not. It's not the, some of the things that get added later on. They go on and on and on with explanation, and you can argue with all of the explanations. So the Augsburg Confession is the basic document, and in fact, if you are going to be in full communion with the, um, the, the ELCA, you must accept as a Valid statement of faith, the Augsburg Confession. So every all our full communion partners, Episcopal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all say that that is a valid expression of faith. And the Roman Catholic Church uh, has said in 1999 that the arguments that led to that statement, uh, the Augsburg Confession, no longer divide us. They're no longer, they're, there's, there's some condemnations of the Roman Catholic Church on us and of us on the Roman Catholic Church that no longer apply. So we moved a long way. Um, then there are others, as he said, the, 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 the two uh, Luther's two small catechisms and a bunch of other things. Um, when you get to the post, the, 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 the second generation folks, um, the, the Luther World Federation does not require us to agree on those because some of them are disagreeable and very divisive. So the what holds the, 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 the Lutheran World Federation together as a communion of churches is the Augsburg Confession. Everything else is considered to be other. You don't have to do that, but to be a part of the Lutheran World Federation, you have to do that and no more. That's the important thing, no more. And it is enough. And to that end, let me read actually what is in the Augsburg Confession because if we're gonna, it's important for us to realize what is it that unites really just a whole slew of Christians through this particular confessional document. So what Pastor Durr is referring to, there are actually not just simply one article that deals with the word separate. There's actually uh, several articles. Um, and they're all kind of 
they're all kind of linked together. Um, and I want to really begin with um, Article 5, right? Uh, it's called Concerning the Ministry of the Church. So the first, the first four articles really deal with, you know, we, we believe, right, that we have a triune God. We believe in uh, basically the sin of origin, origin of sin. That is a whole other kind of words that we'll open for another time. Or if you just send a passenger sermon, he talks about it. Um, then the, uh, the third article deals with what we believe about the person of Jesus, the person of his work. Then we deal about the article of justification. And that's the fourth article. So then the fifth article concerning the ministry. So how is it that we receive right this, this, this free gift of grace that comes through the person of Jesus? And this is exactly what's in our, our, our Oxford Confession, the, the Latin text. So that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and the administrate and administering the sacraments was in an institute. For through the word and the sacraments as through instruments, the Holy Spirit is given, who affects faith where and when it pleases God in those who hear the gospel. That is to say, in those who hear that God, not on account of our own merits, but on account of Christ, justifies those who believe that they are received into grace on account of Christ. So that is really the central part of what we believe in terms of ministry, right? The work that all of us do together, right? This ministry isn't just simply about what Pastor Durr and I do on a Sunday or what Deacon Ben does on a Sunday. This is what is the ministry of the church? What is the gift that the church has received? And that's that's part of what Article 5 talks about is the church has been given this teaching of the gospel. So in however we express the gospel through the liturgy, through the through the preaching, through the teaching, through what we receive in the Lord's Supper, all that is what the church does. That is the things that the church does. And so further on, tied to that is uh, is Article 7. So he says, likewise, we teach that the one holy church will remain will remain forever. The church is the assembly of saints in which the gospel, what we've been talking about, this ministry, right, is taught purely and the sacraments are administered rightly. And it is enough, Silas asked, it is enough for the true unity of the church. So whichever church that wants to join with us in fellowship, it is enough for us to agree concerning the teaching of this gift of grace, the gospel, and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human traditions, rites, ceremonies instituted by human beings be alike everywhere. As Paul says, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all. And that's important for us because as we, at least in, for this moment in our class, you will see that there is such a variety of liturgical rites. And what we believe is we don't have to have one liturgical rite. We have to agree on what we understand about the gospel and how we give the gift of the sacraments to people. So we'll talk about just the varieties of it and how each of these the varieties of these liturgical rites help us receive this gospel and how, and we'll talk a little bit about how the phrases, right, convey some of the deepest convictions that we have as Lutherans about what happens in the Eucharist. So a couple things. First, um, Terry was right that this is about the church, not about us, um, which was a big difference if you think about the Reformation. The Reformation understood the church as, as a bishop, communion with the Roman. Luther says, uh, the Augsburg Confession written by Melanchthon said, the church is the church of Jesus Christ, not the bishops. As a big deal. Second, um, it is enough, it's a really important thing to have for us to have because that means that there's nothing more required. Required is the word I want to focus on. We're required to do certain things, we're required to proclaim the gospel in word and sacrament. That's our job. That's the church's job. When the church says, says you need more than that. The church is wrong. Wrong. So word and sacrament is what makes the church. Um, uh, and uh, there's one more thing I wanted to say, and I was I've gone from my mind. 
So when it comes back, I'll yes, I'll throw it back in. So the beauty of the optimal confession, and I will we've talked about it before it would be nice to continue to have lessons about the book of converts, so we're aware of this. The beauty of the confession is that each of the articles flows naturally from one to the next, the next. So I won't go into this. So what we just talked about, Article 7, what is the church? The next article deals with another part of what is the church. You know, this is the church comprised of only people, right, that have not sinned, only people that have that that are that are blameless in every way possible. Article 8 really deals with no, you if you just see the world and you see the church, right? At this time, we can't tell the difference, right? It's this book, it's this article eight. There isn't this kind of a rigidity to what we can define who's in the church, who's out of the church. And then, then the next article after that discusses, you know, what are these sacraments that we have said define the ministry of the church and our existence as Christians? First one is article nine, deals with baptism. Article 10 is the Lord's Supper, which is what we, we're going to be talking about today. And it's important for us to keep in mind that this document, this collection of documents you have here, right? There's a progression in the theology of the table, right? In the beginning, you have Luther's Luther's catechism that really is trying to explain to people, you know, what is literally, where can you find the doctrine of the Lord's Supper in the scriptures and what kind of grace you can receive? This document here, because it was a public confession, is dealing with how can we, who have different theological uh, uh, traditions, can come together and say, this is just the basics. This is fundamentally, this is what we can kind of agree on. And then later on, when we get, when, and we won't talk about this right now, the formula of Concord, that is really dealing with polemics. Or how do we distinguish true, quote, true Lutherans, the, what's called the Genesio Lutherans, versus the false Lutherans, what they call the crypto Calvinists, the, 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 what is it, the crypto Melanchthonites, I think I remember. Um, and so that, that is much more, it's sharply more focused on really what, what do we not believe in. So this one here is the statement is very short, and it goes like this Concerning the Lord's Supper, it is taught that the true body and blood of Christ are truly present under the form of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper and are distributed and received there. Rejected, therefore, is also the contrary teaching. Full stop. That's it. <laughs> right. That is, so in terms of when we talked about this agreement between these larger church, global church bodies, that is the central thing in terms of the Eucharist, what we agree on. That in some mysterious way, Jesus is, Jesus is present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. How that exists, how that occurs, we have no additional explanation besides. That. All we know is that God, i.e., in Jesus, has promised to be there. So all those words that you have heard in the past, transubstantiation, consubstantiation represents whatever language you've heard. Lutherans say, this is what Lutherans say. They say, yes, and. They don't try to answer a question by making a, 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 a doctrine out of idea. So is Christ present in Holy Communion? The answer yes. is yes. How is Christ present? Mysterious. Not. So is the bread Jesus? Depending, if you go to a Roman Catholic church that, that's teaching the original doctrine of the Roman, I mean, that 16th century doctrine of the Roman Catholic church, that's say the bread, once the blessing is given, is the body of Christ. Is. However you want to define is. Scientifically, theologically, whatever it is, it is the body of Christ. We say yes, but <laughs> it's also bread. Or the, the the extreme Protestants, and I'm going to use that term rather than take a church body, mm -hmm. say eh, it represents the body of Christ. And we say yes, but 
We say yes, but to everything that other people want to make concrete. Because we 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 want to, and this is from Luther on, we want to make clear that this is God's gift, not something that we can define in some ethereal kind of way. Right. Well, <clears throat> my I've always felt that referring it to as the body and blood, uh, you know, we're used to hearing that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, but someone who's not a Christian or who <laughs> You know, to to say, oh, they think I do probably. Yeah. I mean, it's a real put off, I think, and I, I don't know. I don't know how how you can get around that. But it seems like it somehow it could be spoken yeah. about or explained or presented. Let me give you. Not... Let me give you a wonderful image from right in this church. Uh, from my from our point of view at the at the table, it really. I hope this helps you because it helps me all the time. And it's helped me in my whole life. You know, we pick up the bread and we say, um, this is my body. So you know what I see when I see, when I put that bread up like that? I see the bread and all of you. Because this is the body of Christ as well as this is the body of Christ. And for me, I mean, I've done this before because I lived in New York and people ask that question all the time who are not, not, you know, of our kind of Christianity or even not Christians. And the answer is the body of Christ exists in the community as just as, as much as it exists in the bread. And if you get that in your head, you're, all you're doing is, is when you're eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ is quote unquote is you are becoming the body and blood of Christ again. Your 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 right. part your right. is making a physical statement that I'm part of this. But I'm just saying that it, it, to to encourage other people to consider. Yes, exactly. Sometimes I think to talk about drinking the blood and eating the body is just uh, you are crazy. You're crazy. It's very very hard. In, this current society right. to do that. So you have to be expansive rather than restrict. Right, right. Um, and that's the other thing I wanted to say is we have that's what I wanted to say before yeah. is that we believe God comes to us in all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. And you know everybody everybody has their own different way. You know you can get God at a protest, God can be is present. You can get God on the golf course because you're you're out in nature and God is there. Um, but but the Lutheran confessions uh, and and my own personal belief and I hope yours mm -hmm. I hope yours no, is, this, is this you are God is guaranteed to be present no questions maybe it happens on the, uh, in a protest maybe it happens on a, on on the golf course maybe it happens out in the garden but God absolutely promises to be present in word and sacrament. You may find God elsewhere. You will find God in the word and the sacrament. And by word, we don't mean the Bible. We mean the gospel. And I don't mean the four gospels. I mean the promises of God that are all through the Bible. So it's important to get that in your head because otherwise you start to, once you start to define things too far, then you start to limit the number of people who can be a part of that community. Sorry. Yeah, so uh see, and then I mean so that yes, but um isn't that just sort of an intellectual development as people began to observe discrepancies and things and they were kind of forced to yeah, accept that, that or well except except you see, um that would be true today. It yes, wasn't true not, in Luther's day. Okay. In Luther's day, it was it, the goal of this of the Oxford Confession was to keep the church together, mm -hmm. not tear it apart. So, so there are I can't remember how many articles that are we twenty one. Luther says not, not the ones that that we disagree on. Oh. Luther said the, the, I mean Luther the the Oxford Confession said by the way signed by by um, not by theologians but by city council and princes. This is a lay document. Written by a theologian, um, but they agree to it. Well, what we say, these are the things we agree on. We, meaning the whole Christian church, 
And these are the things we're going to talk about. The things we're going to talk about are not necessary. The things we agree on are. So it, it was meant. So that's the yes, but the yes, but it was an intellectual. It was. It was really. It was. One could say it was uh, a theological in the sense that it was about what everybody believes, but it was also political and about to say this is how we can hold together. So you can't. I know we ought to divide political and theological, but you can't do it because it's it's, it's it, this document is to hold people together. And it didn't work in quite a way. Did you and notice the other questions? Sorry, I keep doing this and I don't worry. This is good. This is how we should be having this. <laughs> so to add to, to add to your to what Pastor Dur said specifically about that there are these, there's a numeral ways in which God comes to us, but then there are specific ways that God has promised in the scripture. It's Melanchthon says it this way, and this is really his commentary on. In the Oxford Confession, there is Article 13 that deals with what are the number of sacraments and how do we define a sacrament. So Melanchthon says this, but we do not think it make much difference if for the purpose of teaching different people have different enumerations as long as they properly preserve the matters handed down in scripture. After all, even the ancients did not always agree on the number of them in the same way. If we define the sacraments as rites, which have one, the command of God, and two, to which the promise of grace has been added, it is easy to determine what the sacraments are speaking. Um, further, therefore, the sacraments are actually baptism, the Lord's Supper, and this, this is funny, and absolution. Uh, for these rites have the command of God and the promise of grace, which is the essence of the ages. So, in, in other words, right, if, if we're thinking about what we've been just discussing, Right, we can have an expansive view about how God comes to us, and I think we should. Right, the way that we even understand the sacrament, right? We've been talking about that the body, the body of Jesus, we are the body of Christ. We we are we are the bread and the body of Jesus that has been that has been uh made into bread that has been poured out for the world. And actually, this is a great segue to our hymns <laughs> been poured out to the world. Um, and so it's important for us to have this expansive view, right? So that people can understand that, you know, this isn't just some, as to use the language of theologians, a Copernicistic kind of a like cannibalistic eating and drinking of Jesus, right? It's more than that. It's connection to God. It's connection with each other. And we do that because Jesus is the one who connects us. That's part of why we receive the body and blood. It's like a meal, right? When you have a meal, people come together to do what? Eat. Eat share a meal, to have a common spirit, right? A common sense, right? And there's a central reason why we come together. And for us, we would say that the Holy Spirit gathers us so that we can receive the central meal, which is God himself, who is Jesus. So I want to transition now to a, a, a good hymn that makes this exactly fun. And actually, I'll go first, and then I'll let Pastor Drew choose another hymn. Uh, this is a hymn that I grew up singing. Uh, and you all don't have this one. This is actually only in this hymn, hymnal, which is the Libro de Liturgia y Cantico. It's the Spanish language Lutheran hymn, hymnal. I grew up with this hymn, and it's a hymn we would sing every Sunday. There are two hymns I grew up in this Catholic church that we sang every Sunday. Uh, you have seen us at the Lake Shore, so the Lake Shore. And it's called Una Espiga, uh, uh, a grain of wheat. And it really conveys both this both end of this is the presence of Jesus and we ourselves are the presence of Jesus. And so let me pull it out. It's number 392. <laughs> and let me just read it for you. Uh, verse two, yeah, stanza two. We enjoy true communion in this meal. Many grains God has planted and made dry. Like the grains, we are ground beneath life's sorrowful wheel. In the bread, like grains, we come alive. Stanza three. As grains join to form one loaf of bread, as notes come together in one song, as the raindrops unite into the single vast sea, so in Jesus' one body we belong. Mm -hmm. Stanza four. We shall all sit together at the feast, sharing bread as God's children join in one. In this hope, we rejoice as we go forward in peace, loving sisters and brothers of a song. And then 
the first verse, like just like you usually say again. Um, as grains of wheat richly gilded by the sun, purple clusters collected from the vine, these are made, becoming love's own bread and sweet wine. Now for us, Jesus' body and his blood. It's one of my favorite hymns. And it has the both that it has, we're receiving the, the, what is this bread and wine is for us now, the body and blood of Jesus. And we, as we're receiving this body and blood of Jesus, we are now the body and blood of Jesus. We are now grains of wheat and wine for him. In other words, you are what you eat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we teach, see, we have to be seeing that and we teach that, right? This is, for me, this is my major concern as a theologian is always what people do together, right? That's why I study the liturgy. That's why I study hymns, because what we see here isn't just pretty words or songs. You know, the short phrases are important, right? But we embody what we say, and this changes the way that we actually relate to the world. So that's why I like to study these hymns because we're we are becoming what we are eating and we are singing what we are becoming. So so Martin Luther took that very seriously, what he just said. And so he decided if you could sing it, you could believe it. So he took everything he was teaching and he turned it into music. And usually when he, when he did the music, he took it from the local pub. So Lutheran hymnody, you should know off the bat, uh, some of it is based on Latin chant. And a lot of it, like the one we're going to sing today at the, as the hymn of the day, is a bar song. <laughs> and why did you do that? Because the people would know how to sing it. Um, so Luther wrote two... For, uh, step back one second. Martin Luther was the worst lit liturgist in the entire Lutheran church. Yes. He, yes. he, he, but, but he was a pastor. And his concern was that the people don't get led in a, uh, in a bad direction. So, so some of his liturgies were probably crazy. If we did his, his German mass here, and anyone who wants an hour or less service, would go nuts because that's at least two hours <laughs> just to get the music through and the, and his his direction. He says he takes a lot of things out of the Roman Catholic liturgy of, of his day, uh, but he puts a lot of him in the end. So he's he causes a problem. But I want to I want to draw you to one of his hymns um, that is about Holy Communion, and it's the hymn that he proposed. He sung after. Everyone has received communion. This is the hymn you can, can sing. Uh, and it's number 499 in this book. And here's a, one more thing worth saying, and Christine Griffin will be you can, you can completely change the meaning of something by translating it. <laughs> and a good portion of the New Testament in particular is that. But, this English translation is not bad of, the, of Luther's German, and it's not bad of Luther of the of the Latin prayer that's behind this. I'll say what the prayer is in a minute. But if you look at this, this tells you what we believe in three stanzas, not fifteen or thirty. Three stanzas. Luther tells you what we believe about Holy Communion. Just three verses, and if you look at the bottom of the page, it's a German hymnal, fifteenth century. Stanza one, Martin Luther, stanza two and three, translation composite, which means that they met with the, with the, the original Lutheran. Luther works, the original stuff was very, very nail oriented. That's what that changes. So just listen to the words. This is what we say about Holy Communion. O Lord, we praise you, bless you, and adore you in thanksgiving, bow before you. Here, with your body and your blood, you nourish our weak souls. Why? That they may flourish. O oh Lord, have mercy. I'll get back to that in a minute. May your body, Lord, born of Mary. See what he does? He connects the incarnation of Christ with what happens at the altar. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing has happened here. That our sins and sorrows did carry. So this is how we become free of sin. 
listen to the sermon. Um, your body for us, please, in all trial, here in need, Lord have mercy. So it's saying that, that the body of, of, that we become, the body of Christ that we become, continually reminds God why we became what we became. It's a, it's a continual reminder, not of us, only to us, but to God, that we are God's people made free and have nothing to fear. Your holy body into death was given, life to win for us in heaven. I'll get back to that. No greater love than this to you could bind us. This to you could bind us. So one with Christ. May this feast of that remind us. Lord, your kindness so much did move you that your blood now moves us, living in us, to love you. We're, it's it's the it's the purpose of the gospel to help us to love God and our neighbor. All our debt you have paid, not some of our debt, not part of our debt, all of it done. Peace with God once more is made. In the end, Lord, bestow on us your grace and favor that we follow Christ our Savior and live together. So now we're talking about the unity of the body of Christ in love and union and not repent this communion, which is to say, you don't belong, I do. That's repenting the communion. Let not your good spirit forsake us. Luther says, and, and him says, that what happens in the proclaiming of the gospel in word and sacrament is that God gives the Holy Spirit. That's what, the, that's what this is all about. God giving the Holy Spirit and renewing the Spirit in us, holding us together and giving us the energy to be what Jesus Christ is in the world. Um, uh, let not your good spirit forsake us by this holy banquet maker. We make us constantly being renewed. Give your church, Lord, to see days of peace and unity. Luther's writing this when the church is not at peace or in unity. Um, but he's saying that that's what this does. If we can agree on the word and the sacrament. If, so when people come to the table, um, lots of things are happening to them. And they are becoming a one, one with God, one with Christ. And they're also becoming one in mission to the world. That doesn't mean we all agree, but it means that we all have the spirit of God to do something, to be something. There's a purpose to it. And I'm, I'm upset from, from that. One hymn says a whole lot. He wrote, you know, that every, if you want to really, and no Luther hymnal has ever concluded this, included this, but Luther wrote a hymn for every, every sacrament, everything in the catechism, Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, is a hymn, and you know, and all based on German folk songs, bar songs, so that the kids would know it. Um, that was a big deal for him. So that's kind of Lutheran theology about what what happens when the table, what, what are we doing? And, and, and it also eliminates us saying that some things, you got to wear vestments. Mm -hmm. Man. You got to be at a table. Man. I mean, there are not too many goddess in it, it, but, but when it happens, Christ promises to be present, God promises to be present. And that's it. God, it, it, you can bet on it. Um, and so that's, it's important to get that in your head. So to, to stress that particular point about our common Lutheran tradition, right? Uh, on your own time, I suggest if you have a chance, 488, so adorn yourself with gladness. 488. So this has been our ELW. This... <laughs> It's a hymn that can be found. Yeah. Whether you have, this is one of our original hymnals that we had here at Christ the King when we were a part of the Augustana Synod. Soul, adorn yourself with gladness is in this one. 
It is in when the LCA had their hymnal, service book and hymnal. It is in service book and hymnal. We can even go with our Missouri Synod friends. It is in the Lutheran hymnal. <laughs> it is in their, and this is funny, this is the Lutheran hymnal, 40s, 2000s was their next hymnal. Uh, Lutheran book is Lutheran service book. It is in Lutheran service book. Then if we go with RN, it is also in the Lutheran book of worship. Right, and it is there's a family version in the LLC and it's in our LW, and it's in the uh, Book of Common, um, the hymnal that goes with the uh, uh, Episcopal and Anglican mm -hmm. Books of Common Prayer. It's in every major Protestant denomination in the world. Um, so and, and maybe I can just say one word about the authors because it's useful to get this right. So if you look at that hymn, the, the, the text is by Johann Planck and the music is by Johann Kruger. They were, that was the pastor and the organist of a congregation in Berlin during the plagues. Mm. And there's a lot of their hymns. It, it's worth knowing this when there are a lot of their hymns. Uh, 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 Franck lost his entire family. Mm -hmm. Kruger lost most of his family. They lost a good chunk of the congregation. You can still, by the way, see the church in Berlin, except it's not a church. Anymore. But um, they wrote hymns like this. And you know, my favorite, Awake My Heart with Gladness, is my favorite hymn. Wow, all hell was breaking loose in them, and they around them and among them. And they, so they're what they are expressing is a faith. Despite all the evidence that God doesn't love you anymore, mm. that this is God's punishment. No, their faith keeps coming through these hymns, these and that's that it's good. I was really excited when when Terry told me to focus on this thing because this is really sensitive. I mean, so adorn yourself with gladness. I just buried my family. Imagine saying that. Mm. I've been down that's down this road, so I could tell you this is hard to say. Um, but it's true. And you can see that even clearly, verse 3. Yeah. Now, now in faith, I humbly ponder over this surpassing wonder that the bread of life is boundless, though the souls it feeds are countless. With the choicest wine of heaven, Christ's own blood to us is given. O oh, most glorious consolation, pledge, and seal of my salvation. Pledge is promise. Promise. It's the gospel. And then further, you see this kind of very personalizing of the Eucharist in verse 4. Jesus, source of lasting, lasting pleasure, truest friend, and dearest treasure. I love this language. Peace beyond all understanding, joy into all life expanding. Humbly now I bow before you, love incarnate, I adore you. Worthily let me receive you, and so favored never leave her. right in the in the lutheran tradition this word worthily right, is an important word for us to talk about now right we think about a lot of people think worthily means i have to get right with god first before i get communion right and in some traditions that solidified in the kingdom of the roman catholic churches you have confession absolution and then you are prepared to receive the sacrament for us the only sense of worthiness is the need for the sacrament, i.e., we need faith. Right? There's a trust that in the very, the, in the very bread that we eat and the and the wine that we drink, there is our dearest friend and our purest pleasure. Right? It's Jesus. That's the only thing. That's the worthiness that that really makes us able to receive the sacrament. There's nothing else. There's nothing else to it. If anyone else says the contrary, they're wrong. I mean, I hate to say it. I'm just going to say that. No, 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 no. And, and so that gets us to where we're at today. Um, when, and where most of you were not at when you were young. And that is it. We used to say, um, well, I'm going to put this this way. A lot of what you and I grew up with, not so much you, but you and I grew up with, we grew up with because the 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 liturgy of the church 
was created to say how we're different from other other Christians and other people, not the same. So if you went to, if, if in 1967, you went to a Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Presbyterian church, what would be in the service would be way, ways in each one that said the other ones are wrong. <laughs> we grew up with that. We grew up with an understanding of the church that you had to agree on everything in order to receive all the community, which has never been true, by the way. So the whole what 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 gets what gets dismissed as a liturgical reform, but was a theological gospel reform in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, mostly in the 60s and 70s. And it was to say, it is to say what 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 Dario just said is that and A, everybody's welcome to the table. Radical when you're and B, we're gonna find a way to do liturgy. In which all of us, all of us stop saying things against each other and start doing worship that is the same. And so if you ever went in the 1970s or early 80s to, to the chains a little bit with Pope Benedict, but you could go to a Roman Catholic church, a Lutheran church, an Episcopal church, even a Presbyterian church, and everybody would be using exactly the same readings. And with little nuance changes, same words. That the, the goal of that was to say liturgically that all are welcome at the table. Did we say that to be a lot of, uh, in practice? Often not. But but <laughs> Christ the King. The more I learned about Christ the King, the more I'm amazed. Uh, this church, I mean, that uh, that it, you know. The pastors who were here and the people who were here who went along with this, uh, maybe even even strongly, maybe more strongly agree with it now. They understood that more than they understood the old days of being different, different and saying it every Sunday. Saying how we're different. So this, this and why did we do that? Because because why why did we emphasize differences because we were at war with each other. I, I'm not talking about we were disagreeing from the from the from the time of Luther um, until the end of the Second World War, Lutheran, Roman, and Roman Catholics were like this toward each other. And I mean physically like this at war. Same thing with with those damn Calvinists. We were the same thing, you know, we're gonna do this. It took World War II and it took the Holocaust. Sorry, but this is true. It took terrible things happening for Christians to say, you know what? We screwed up for the last 500 years. We got to get back to where we were. What, what's back to where we were? Back to where we were is to get to the liturgy of the church, the worship of the church, and more importantly, the practices of the church that we had before Emperor Constantine Turn the church, turn turn Christianity into a state religion. So the liturgies, all the liturgies we use would be recognizable to someone in the in the late two hundreds, early three hundreds, more so than everything that happened after that, and certainly more so than happened uh, um, in the Reformation period on. So the Holy Spirit, I think, worked there to, to make us understand we don't fence the altar. You don't, you know, you don't put the sacrament into a box. You don't preach, preach the gospel only to the people who are already agreeing with you on everything from language to uh, color of, of, of skin to everything else. That's and that's that that you you and I are the beneficiaries, or, or that we we know what difference it would make. And someone like Serio at his age is the beneficiary of it. We know the difference. Because we lived it. Sorry again, I go on. I, I do this because I'm. So yes, actually, we'll take a question and then we'll transition to our last part, which is actually a little bit of a lynch. I see. Well, this, I, I was deceived by your title, post and postmodern, because one of the things that strikes me as the difficulty of the meal as the center of our worship is 
if you read what goes on in the world today, family dinner is long gone. The notion of people that that's a very important part of life is fading away. And I think that's a problem. Yeah, I agree. I'll tell you a quick story. When my youngest son went to a, a, a private boys' school in New York, when we moved to New York, his best friend was named Sam Kish. Kish, if you, if you I don't, don't know that name, they build everything. They own the New York Giants. They own wings of the Metropolitan Museum. They own wings of hospital. They have more money than God. <laughs> um, Sam, his, his friend Sam, um, Jonathan would go to their house often, their apartment, which was three floors of an apartment on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, across from the museum of the Metropolitan Museum. They would come to our house, which was three rooms um, in on the fifth floor of a building, um, all worth a lot of money, but nevertheless, not as much as that. <laughs> Sam loved coming to our house. You know why? Because we ate together. And, and this is the job. I mean, we had this conversation yesterday at the, at the council retreat, um, and that is that um, some things that some things like this, you are exactly right, Christine. Some things like this, we have to talk about restoring them mm -hmm. because the family meal changes the family. It makes the family. That's what we say about Holy Communion. So you are 100% right. But, but what we do is, what I think the error of the Christian church is to say, I'm, we're not going to do anything about that. We should be doing something about that. We should be. So what? we should help families find a way eat together. No, there are some things we should actually ask our families to do. And one of them is eat together. I, and weird as that sounds, now that changes everything. Uh, I watched it happen with this kid who, was a, who, who is a, I mean, a kid now. He's running part of the business, so he's, he's a multimillionaire. But he would come to, and he would, you know, he's Jewish. He's, his family was across the street at the synagogue that was across the street from St. Peter's. This kid loved and loved the fact that we prayed together. Again, Luther, it's Luther centers the way you learn the faith. It's not in the church, in the family. The Luther, the catechism says how, how, how the head of the household, he meant the father, and teaches the family. Teaches the kids the thing. So we just have that. It's not that we tell them you must do this. We help them to do this. And we don't help them to do this, by the way, by adding a whole list of things they have to do in church to their already long list of what they have to do to be alive in the 21st century. So part of the challenge with us as liturgical churches is, you know, as much as our liturgy is right directed toward God and thanks and praise, right? It is a norm, it should be a normative way to show us, right, this, these central realities of how we should eat, how we should, how we should, how we should live our lives together, how we should feed the world, right? All of this, in some respects, can be seen within our liturgical rites. And I wish we could have a little more time to talk about that. Yeah, I talk to myself. No, 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 no. Actually, but this is important. We need it. what you said and what he has been said. Um, and so uh, if you go to page 108 in your hymn line, here it is. I have my little one. This is my per this one is my personal hymn. I have this. Oh, yeah. it's kind of broken. This is the setting one, right? This is the uh, Catholic, is it? I can tell No, this is uh also right. Christiana. This is uh, this was this Eucharistic prayer was written in the 19 early 1900s to bring Lutherans right. together. You are the only one my name number two. Oh, oh. that's just number oh, no, sorry, number one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'll get the compulsive so, one. Good. So, so page it's one oh eight, page one oh eight in your hymnal. Not hymn number one. So page page one oh eight. Yeah. It's a little bit hymn yeah. one oh eight is different from page yeah. one oh eight. Sorry. Yeah, we're all right, so uh, the numbers are on the bottom of the page. Yes, that's the way I used to do it. 
The numbers are the bottom of the page. They didn't put the top of the page. So we're not, we're not waiting, right? Uh, number one, write number one as opposed to two. So we have here, right, that Eucharistic prayer is a prayer that's an address to God the Father, right? Everything that we do in the church, the prayers that we direct in throughout our entire worship is directed to God the Father. And it's because the, the our understanding of worship is we're addressing the three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, and the model for understanding this is actually Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed to his Father, right? And Jesus prayed to his Father for all sorts of needs, which you see in the, in, the, in the Lord's prayer. So when we have a Eucharistic liturgy, typically we're addressing the Father. So whenever you have a Eucharistic rite, the first sentences are directed to the Father. It may not say Father, it may say Almighty and Merciful God, you are most holy and great is your majesty of your glory. That is always the Father. Then the next one is typically uh, talks about what we call salvation history. What, why do we give thanks to God, right? And number one is very easy. The, this right, number one, is easy. You so love the world that you gave your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. The next part is basically what, what we get the word Eucharist. Thank you. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation, right? So this is really the model for how we ought to live our lives uh, at the table. And we were talking about right now about how we should have our family dinners, how we should really help the world and feed the world. We first begin with thanking God for all the blessings that we have received, right? When you ask your family members, can someone say grace, right? We direct it to God the Father. A good way is one of the prayers that I always say is this one. The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food and their due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the need of every living thing. And you send me prayer. Amen. Right? That's one of Luther's actual table blessings that he has in the small catechism. Right? So that's a model. That's where one of those touch points between what we do in the work service and what we do at home in the table, right? The next part, um, page 109, we have what's known as the verba institutionis, the words of the institution, which is the, inst the night in which Jesus gave for us his promise, the promise that he would be with us always in the body and in the blood and bread and wine. And so this is the moment where we typically, Pastor Durr and I, we chant this. What's very unique about when we actually chant these words is uh, the chanting that is in our, it's the one that I learned, is the chanting that actually is, is uniquely Lutheran. Bach developed that chant setting uh, in a way that helps us right, understand our distinctive Lutheran understanding. So if you notice when I chant, right, I chant in my normal voice, in the night in which he was betrayed, on our Jesus the bread, right, that's me chanting. And then when you hear me chant, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Bach believed that Jesus was a baritone. <laughs> <laughs> so when you hear that skip, right, it's actually, you're supposed to, as, as leaders, know was that actually it's Jesus who's now chanting to you, who's speaking to you. This is the promise. This is the words that you are to eat and drink. That's at least how I learned it. Have to learn it. No, that, no, I, I, well, it's the same argument. It's yeah. just a different chant. Yeah. And it, so there's a, there's a way to chant the gospel. And he's right. Uh, it, not only Bach, but all of his predecessors thought Jesus was a baritone. <laughs> so you suddenly rock a, what is called a gospel poem. Yeah. Right? And it's, it's, it goes back to the third, fourth century. Can I just jump you to another Eucharistic prayer? But you want to finish this first, right? Yeah, I'll finish it very quickly and then you'll have a lot of two, two minutes. All right. So further on, right, we go to the what after the, the proclamation, Christ has died, Christ has and Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, 
And his promise of coming in, we call this the amnesis, the remembrance. Uh, we have to get the word amnesia <laughs> to remember. This is our remembrance of why we are here giving thanks to God. It says, we give thanks to you, almighty God, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we ask you to accept our praise and thanksgiving with your word and your spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sins may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance of all your sins. In other words, let us become what we're supposed to be eating. And as we become as we eat, right, we hope that our tables can likewise reflect the same thing. When we go home with our families, we hope that what we eat, we become what we eat, which is the body and blood of Jesus. We, we, be, we become united as one people. We, we help our children to be born in the same kind of heavenly inheritance, right? And then we can feed our world out of, out of this particular inheritance. So we'll be hearing more about that in the next four weeks. Just how does that, how do we actually live out? Right, what we have received. How do we become what we receive? And so we'll be hearing different topics discuss how we become what we have received. So just to give you this, and without a lot of explanation, if you turn to the bottom of the page, page 69 in the front, there's a Eucharistic prayer that's listed as XI, Eucharistic prayer 11. And this is the one that comes from before. Uh, this is the Hippolytan canon, and it comes from before Constantine, before Augustine, um, and, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things, and then I'm done. The first one says, well, exactly what's said ago, this is the 300s. We thank you, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved son. So it's, a, it's you're praying through Christ to God. Um, then in the second paragraph, it's, it does what good Anglicans do. It's the incarnation of Christ. He is your word inseparable from you, and it goes on. The third one says, why did Jesus get born, and what happens in this communion? In order to just listen to these phrases, destroy them, break the bonds of the evil one, crush hell underfoot, give light to the righteous, establish his covenant and show forth the resurrection. That's what so all the stuff that that not only is Christ's mission statement but ours is in that one set. And then uh you get the words because you gotta have the words talk about that some other time. Mm -hmm. Um then it talks about giving thanks and finally it ends up asking that asking God to make the church one. 300s, maybe 300. It's early in the history of the church. We use this here on um, the Easter vigil and we use it at Christmas because now God has given us the, and there's some good and some bad, and we do both. Um, <laughs> we do. Their Eucharistic prayer is the Lord. When when I was ordained, there were three plus the words of the institution. Now there's God knows them. Thank you. Thank you. So, said. we want to thank, thank you all for, for uh, this time. This is we've gone a little bit over time, but we are so glad that you could join us for our first uh, lesson uh, for of our series here. Next week, we'll have the wonderful Dr. Christine Wallace, who will lead us through uh, some of the uh, New Testament uh, synopsis of what is what did the early Christians believe, or at least think about what is it that we do at the table. And so, we're so glad. Hopefully, you can. See, meet us here next week, same time, same place. And uh, as you go, I have a Eucharistic prayer for you all to consider. As you mull oh, over what we've learned, right? Think about what we've learned and how you can see this particular yeah. Eucharist in that light. I used to teach at this seminar. Here we go. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone at home. I actually used to. Seems all. Bye. This is so cool. <laughs>